So on H329, um, if we remember correctly, it had um, it's distinct from H320, um, but it does deal with workplace discrimination. And I wanted to offer um, Susanna Davis, who is here with us today, um, the opportunity to testify that on this. We had a number of folks who testified earlier, and some of whom I may invite back once we, as we gain a better context of um, uh, and knowledge of what this bill entails. But um, I wanted to give Susanna an opportunity as the executive director of racial equity um, and on the governor's task force of racial uh, and chair of the governor's task force on racial equality, the opportunity to weigh in on this bill. So welcome back, Susanna. Uh, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's good to be here. Um, so well, the, microphone, the microphone is yours. I'm sorry, there's, we've got a slight delay going on, so I'll try to be patient on, on our back and forth. Again, it's, uh, it, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the State of Vermont. And as usual, I'm going to try to keep my comments brief. Um, you all have already heard from others on this bill as well, some of our colleagues around the state, including the HRC Executive Director, whose testimony was largely in alignment with ours. Um, I am going to appear here in support of H329. This is a bill that, again, helps to close gaps for employees who are at highest risk of experiencing discrimination, harassment, or misconduct in their workplaces. This is also something that was a recommendation of the Racial Equity Task Force in its first report. And as we did last time, I'm happy to include a link to that report in the chat so that when you all have the opportunity, perhaps it can be put on the committee's page. Um, this bill, of course, would amend the standard of proof so that employees who are experiencing harassment or discrimination don't necessarily have to meet a burden of proof that is largely for many of them unattainable. The fact is that discrimination today in the United States looks very different often than it did in years past, but still has incredibly tumultuous and difficult negative effects. So we've gotten better at causing people harm, sadly, in places of public accommodation, in workplaces, in schools, et cetera. And as such, our law needs to be modernized and updated in such a way that permits people to be able to adapt and flex with all of the different ways that uh, harassment and discrimination takes place. I'll give a more concrete example. We know, and I apologize for continuing to touch my ear. I'm trying to keep my headphone in place. Um, the, for example, in decades past, social media bullying wasn't really a thing that we knew how to handle or even could have foreseen. But today, it's something that has driven people to commit heinous acts and sometimes tragic acts of self-harm. And so when we think about the ways in which harassment, bullying, hazing, and discrimination have evolved, so too must we in, in the way that we address it. So um, extending statutes of limitations for bringing claims is also important. We know that there is a strong chilling effect for people who want to pursue a claim, particularly if they are pursuing a claim based on an immutable factor that makes them a stark minority. I'll explain what I mean in a little bit clearer terms. Uh, it's one thing for a woman identified person who is you know, part of a gender group that's 51% of the population to bring a claim of gender based harassment. It's another thing for a person in a state that is 94 or now 89% white to bring a claim of racial discrimination in a state where they may only represent 1.3% of the entire population, let alone whatever percentage of their workplace. That being said, um, the chilling effect is absolutely a factor that oftentimes drives people to wait to consider their options, to think about whether it's worth it or to try to live with it. Uh, many times we're told as children, just ignore the bullies. But we find that increasingly that's a strategy that not only doesn't work, but that is a, a form of tacit approval of the intimidation or other bad behavior. So extension of statute of limitations is important. Um, modification of the standard, the burden of proof is important. And I believe the other aspects of this bill include, 
um, not requiring the employee to prove that other similarly situated employees were treated the, differently. Um, that's another important piece of it because oftentimes it's implied that if there's discrimination happening based on a particular immutable factor, that everyone in the environment who's a member of that demographic group would also be experiencing the same treatment. But we know that's not always the case. Sometimes um, people are singled out for whatever reason. And it's not necessarily up to us to explain why others are not experiencing discrimination. One thing that I often remark to people is that it's not up to people of color to prove or improve the circumstances of their oppression. Similarly, it's not up to people of color or members of any other historically marginalized group to have to prove why other people are or are not experiencing discrimination. So this is also another important uh, aspect of the bill that reduces the very slanted odds of um, failure of a claim or a dismissal of a claim of discrimination. I'm going to pause there because um, I've gotten to the point where I'm now just telling you what the bill does, and I know that you already know that. So as always, I'm available for any questions, and I'm going to remove this earpiece because it's more of a bother to me than a help. All right, can you hear us? <clears throat> can you hear us now? You froze there for a minute there. And, uh, so, uh, um, Susanna, a quick question just on the, um, we took testimony and we heard about um, the extension of the statute of limitations. And I'm just curious if you could if you could uh, talk a little bit further about that about why it's why it's important in the work that you that in the work that you do the work that you see with 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 individuals in terms of um, how long it may take to be able to even report. Absolutely. So we have seen at the local I should say at the micro and the macro level efforts by individuals, by organizations, and by governments to address harm. This could be something big, like topically, the uh, establishment of a truth and reconciliation process at a national level in countries we've seen before. Or this could happen at the micro level, which might just be somebody going down to the local police department and filing a report of graffiti. So in all cases along the, that spectrum, we often assume in policymaking that a stack, that a clock should begin running from the time of harm. And we assume that there's a reasonable period during which a person should file a claim based on when that clock begins running. But one thing that our historical policymaking has not taken into account is the impact of trauma. It is not trauma informed. And the reason for that is we don't acknowledge the fact that many people experiencing harm are in the moment, not, they're still processing what's happening to them. Either they're not sure if it's really harassment or discrimination. And as, as a person of color, as a woman identified person, as a young person in an office setting, I can tell you that it is often the case that we are made to second guess ourselves. Did you really mean it that way? What was that supposed to mean? Are they doing this to me, singling me out? Maybe I'm being oversensitive. Am I overreacting? This happens all the time. And so by the time you get to the point where you come to the determination that, yes, I do, I do believe that I'm being singled out, at that point, it's probably already gone on for some time. Then beyond that, now you're processing what's happening or what you perceive to be happening to you. And that takes time. The last couple of years have shown us that mental health is absolutely something that matters to each and every one of us. You think it doesn't affect you until it does. And suddenly you don't know what to do because you've never had to think of it before. So when we think about um, the, the mental health impact of workplace discrimination, harassment, et cetera, it's really important to keep in mind that oftentimes it's gonna take people a while just to process what's happening before they get to the point where they wanna to decide to do something about it. Now they get to the point where they wanna to decide to do something about it. The first question they're gonna have is, who do I go to? Do I go to a supervisor? Do I go to someone above the supervisor? What if that harms me professionally? Do I go to an outside entity? Do we have an HR department? Is this something that they do? You send an email, you don't hear back for three days. Now it's been a week, you're not really sure. Oh, HR can't help me. What if I go somewhere external? Do we have a human 
rights commission in the state? Yes, I will. I'll send another email. I might hear back within 48 hours. But then at that point, it's a question and answer period. It's a back and forth by email. By the time you get in touch with somebody who actually can help you, who helps you understand your options, and who has convinced you that this may or may not be a good um, strategy to take, a considerable amount of time has passed. Now you may decide, you know what, it's not worth it. I don't wanna lose my job. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit on this for a while, but then it keeps happening. And you think, well, you know what, maybe I'll transfer departments and that might help. And then it keeps happening. And at that point, maybe it's been six months, maybe it's been a year, maybe it's been longer than that. Um, I feel as if I'm rambling, so I'm gonna cut it off here, but, but what I'm trying to get at is that there are psychological and logistical and operational reasons why an extension of the statute of limitations is helpful. Not only because of the chilling effect of reporting at the individual level in real time, not only because of the bureaucratic nature of addressing these sorts of claims as you proceed, but also because sometimes you look retrospectively, retroactively, and you might say to yourself, you know what, I experienced harm then, I didn't do anything about it, I'm still experiencing the negative impacts of that harm, and I've decided I want to do something about that. And it's important that when we make law and when we make policy that's designed to address harm, that we do so in a way that is more inclusive of that long range harm, not punitive of those who are fearful of trusting us enough to take us up at the beginning. I will add one more thing, um, and that is that one of the ways in which this harm often is experienced is with people who may have language barriers. And so if you're somebody who may have um, unstable status in the country or who may be limited English proficient, then all of this timing is even longer for you because navigating uh, a world or a workplace or a process in a language that may not be your first also compounds the amount of time uh, and the added challenge that it takes for you to be able to successfully do a claim. Representative Kalaki has a question. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Um, Damien, I, I wonder if you could help me understand the current law about need not pursue an internal grievance prior to, to filing. And then if I could ask Susanna to, to discuss that in terms of this amendment, because I don't know what the current law states. So um, to answer your question, the, the current law is silent on that issue, uh, but it, it can be uh, an issue that plays into the consideration uh, when it gets to the trial court as to whether the, uh, whether the individual um, took appropriate actions to try to stop the behavior, whether uh, the behavior was severe or pervasive at uh, their workplace. So it goes into the, the factual considerations as to whether there was a hostile work environment created. The other area where it, it comes into play in current law, uh, and the, the bill wouldn't prevent this from occurring, uh, is uh, it goes to the issue of notice to the employer. So one of, one of the current requirements in law is that as an employer, if you become aware that uh, any form of discrimination that uh, is occurring within your office, so if there's illegal discrimination occurring, you have a legal obligation to uh, stop that discrimination from continuing. Um, and so there, there is that does come up uh, in terms of liability for employers, um, but often it's flipped around as an argument where if an individual doesn't take advantage of the internal process, there's an argument that um, you know maybe they didn't take adequate steps to address the problem and it would have gone away if they pursued the internal process, or maybe it wasn't as severe or pervasive as they're arguing. So uh, the bill here is, uh, it's not doing away with the opportunity of individuals to pursue an internal grievance process, but it's taking that off the table as a consideration for determining if 
the behavior they experienced constituted unwanted uh, discrimination. And it, it's worth noting too that uh, this isn't the only way that an employer could be liable for discrimination that occurred within their office. Um, employers are, uh, if it's a manager or uh, an executive or another person in a leadership position who's engaging in the discrimination, the employer is uh, basically deemed to have knowledge of that because that person is acting as the employer's agent. Um, but on the other hand, if it's just a line employee um, or you know a, a regular employee and the manager is not aware that the behavior is occurring, the, the internal grievance process is a way for the individual to try to make that go away and then puts the burden on the employer to address the issue. However, um, what this bill is really concerned about is, is the flip side of that where if you're afraid that that's a futile process because of the individual who you have to bring the complaint to uh, or because of the power dynamic or because of the way the last individual was treated, um, it, it takes that off the table so that you're not, your claim isn't harmed by your failure to pursue a process that you might have per perceived as being futile or ineffective. Does that make sense? It's, that was probably a very convoluted answer. Well, no, I, you, you, you got the, the part I was, and you did answer it, thank you, was the bill also proposed to amend the law prohibiting employment discrimination to provide that an employee need not pursue an internal grievance. But what I'm hearing from you, there isn't any clarity in the law right now about that. Is that yeah, correct? I mean, there, there's, there is case law where they consider case law. Okay. individual pursues the grievance, but it's not in our statute right now. Um, and this that provision is is sort of consistent with the general thrust of the bill to uh, limit the barriers to making a successful discrimination claim. So right now, the severe or pervasive standard forms a barrier in some cases. Um, and then this is another uh, barrier that's formed in some cases where an individual doesn't pursue the internal process because they don't believe that it's going to be successful for them for whatever reason. And then in court, that's considered as evidence against it being severe or pervasive or sufficient to create a hostile work environment. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm in, in support of this bill, and I love the ex extension of the, the six years. Um, but I, I'm just saying, if, if it isn't in the law, we don't have to say it, amend the law prohibiting about notice. Because if it's not in the law, there's nothing to amend there. Yeah, no, this, this would be adding, adding uh, this together with the severe or pervasive language is addressing uh, case law, not statutory law. Okay, so I, I understand. Okay, thank you for that. Sorry. And Susanna, no, it's fine. I mean, you work within a large state now, <laughs> the administration. Any, you, you, your thoughts on this part would be appreciated. Yeah, thank you, Representative. I think that um, Damien's ex explanation is exactly right. It really addresses something that's not necessarily, that, something on which the law is silent. And the trick to the current circumstances is that um, the more we use it as a, an informal measurement, uh, that is to say, the more that we say, well, let's look at some, some of the factors involved. Did the person come forward with an internal claim? No, mm, wonder why, it's not looking good for you. The more that we do that informally, the more that it starts to become um, a de facto practice. And then at that point, it doesn't matter whether the law is silent on it, it, it becomes an, a, a presumptive part of the process. So what this amendment would do is to say that um, whether you look at that as a factor or not, it's not something the employee would have been required to do. So it shouldn't necessarily be counted against the person if they didn't. And, you know, I think about um, the... I think about what it means to go with an internal investigation or, or to file an internal grievance first. Um, 
personally, it's probably something that I would see as um, a thorough or good practice, something for good measure. However, that operates on the assumption that the internal process, first of all, even exists. Second, that it is robust enough and, and that it could support an adequate investigation of the circumstances. I mean, we have some workplaces that have just very small teams or inexperienced HR um, liaisons who may not have enough experience doing these to be able to say that their internal grievance process is even worth its salt. Third, it presumes that that process is even trustworthy. After all, the person to whom you're supposed to bring your complaint is someone who has participated in or at the very least tacitly allowed the behavior to, uh, to happen, then what are the odds that your internal process is gonna go in a way that, that's just? So for all of those reasons, I think allowing um, more clarity about whether an employee should have to go through that kind of a process is important. It also matters because when you think about timing, again, I mean, one of the concerns with something like a statute of limitations is how long does a person have to be able to bring a claim? And if we expect the person to have gone through certain prior steps that may or may not be fruitful, then we're also compounding the impact of that, that time pressure. Uh, I think the last thing that I would add about this piece of it is that we want to be able to plan for contingencies. Ideally, internal grievance processes are effective and equitable and are uh, trustworthy. Oftentimes they are not though. And in those circumstances, you wanna make sure that our law can be um, applicable to people on the spectrum of experiencing harassment. And I'm thinking back to Bo Yang's testimony, I think last week or the week before, where she mentioned a case in which a person who had brought claims, a person had been experiencing gender-based discrimination and also race-based discrimination. And the finding was that the gender-based discrimination wasn't pervasive enough and the race-based discrimination wasn't pervasive enough, even though taken together, um, the two things were pretty egregious. But when you separate them out based on the, the cause of action or the protected category, it ends up um, blunting the effects of, of each. And so when I think about um, having to go through something like an internal grievance process and having that sort of thing be picked apart, at that, at that first level, um, it might end up, again, either creating chilling effect or somehow negatively impacting a person's ability to bring a claim down the line if, um, if those kinds of things are, are muddled and parsed out through a process that may or may not have been conducted thoroughly. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, further questions for Susanna at this time? All right, and thank you for your sharing your thoughts on this on this bill. Um, and we'll we schedule we'll, we'll schedule another another conversation on this coming up soon. Can you think of anyone, Susanna? Um, can you think of anyone else that we should be talking to? on this bill, uh, or at least categories of people that we should be talking to on this bill? Yes, I would say that it's always good practice to continue um, hearing from individuals, members of the community themselves. If you haven't heard from someone who may be limited English proficient or who serves people who are limited English proficient who have experienced this, I would strongly recommend reaching out to them. That might include anyone from AALV or the uh, New Americans Advisory Council or the USCRI or any of the local groups, perhaps even Howard Center, um, people who have close contact with, with that population. I would also consider, I would also consider following up with an email with more names when I can think of them. Okay, no, that would be, that would be great. Cause this is, um, no, I would, I would appreciate that um, very much. And you know, the, you have more than an hour. Just over the next few days, whenever you have time, that would be great. <laughs> so um, whenever, whenever you can, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right. Um, Damien, did you get a text from Ron? A text? About 477. 
Did we reach out to you? Huh. Uh, <laughs> that was like, ah, that was, great, like, he, uh, he might have texted me, but I did not look at my phone on my break. Um, okay, so I had asked, I had asked, um, we that? have 477, H477 scheduled for this afternoon, but I, I wanted to um, take, take the time that we've been talking about this afternoon and do it now. If that's okay, everybody's here. It's, it's just sort of a very easy walk. It, it's a very easy walkthrough, but I think that. But not a simple little bit. <laughs> but not a simple little okay. bill. And it's just an example of that. I just want to. Is, are, I mean, I, I'm good to go. I, I feel so. This feels so luxurious to have you not running in and out of the room to 17 different places. So um, oh, believe me, it feels great. It's like, that's only because it's January. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but we'll take it when, yeah. when we get it. So, um, so folks, H477, I'm, I'm just going to kind of just do a bill introduction for my guests from here. And, and I'm going to be real, I'm going to be short because um, I think Damien will explain this whole thing. Um, a few years ago, I sponsored a bill and we passed it, and it and it I believe it passed relative. It might have been unanimous on the floor, um, but it was it was about um, employees who had suffered a crime and uh, needed a, needed time off, protected time off. From their work when they had to deal with the crime, the, the outcome um, of the crime, including trial time. And um, so we proposed a bill that allowed that to happen. And it was, like I said, it was um, not the equivalent of having a crime victim bill of rights, but it was, it, it was a benefit. I hesitate to even use the word benefit because, again, if someone has suffered a crime that they have to deal with the the, the fallout from that and, and and have to testify in court or have to deal with other um, could be medical issues, could be family issues related to that, um, it seemed to be unfair that people did not have the opportunity to have protected time off, and so it was. We passed it. It was it. There was very little pushback against it. Everybody seemed to think that it filled a, 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 an important loophole. And then I got a call from Damien. This call. <laughs> we passed that recently, didn't we? Uh, two years ago. It was two years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, Before and, I lied. And so I want, <clears throat> I basically want Damien to, I mean, again, and when you look at this bill, and you don't see what the context is or anything else, it's like, well, it's just erasing a line. It's just taking out a line. Isn't that simple? Mm -hmm. But, you know, Damien, it took Damien a while for him to, to just sort of get at what was going on here. And so I wanted to just create the idea that there is no simple bill, no matter how simple it looks, and um, take the opportunity to... to, to let Damien now expound on why this bill, is, why this is important, and what it, what it, um, what could have happened, what could happen if we keep it this way. Right. So, um, <laughs> well, currently the the current law, the issue with it, and this came up in the context of of the Joint Legislative Management Committee adopting policies for the, the General Assembly's employees. And so uh, in working with our human resources department here at the legislature, uh, we were drafting policies that were at least as effective as the Vermont statutes. Uh, and we drafted one uh, to create uh, an official crime victims leave policy because the um, a lot of people don't actually realize that they have the right to take this leave. Um, and it's, uh, so we were adopting that policy and Senator Benning, um, who all of you know, uh, is, a he's a criminal defense attorney and he raised some concerns. Uh, his concern was primarily with the use of the term crime victim. Um, but in, in discussing that with him, what I realized 
uh, was that the, the definition of crime victim in the statute uh, is broader than the actual people who are entitled to take leave under the statute. Um, so I think what it would be most helpful to do is to start with first uh, the, the statute itself. Uh, I'll start with the definition of crime victim, and then I'll take you to the actual statute and show you how the statute is narrower. Um, and so the bill proposes to just strike out the reference to crime victim um, here. And so we'll kind of work from there, but then um, this, this will give you a sense of uh, the who we've defined as a crime victim. And that definition is important for purposes of anti-discrimination law, because you once you're a crime victim under this definition, uh, you are protected against discrimination based on your status as a victim. But you're also entitled to leave to go to the hearings related to that, um, where you're obtaining, trying to obtain an order against stalking or sexual assault something like that. Uh, and so the, there's a terminology issue in our statute. And when we adopted it a few years ago, um, I'm sorry to say that this uh, totally slipped by me in the drafting. Uh, and it wasn't until we were having that discussion over who was protected and, and so forth in relation to the, the legislative uh, employment policies that I realized that the terminology here is, is problematic in the statute. So that's the background. Um, and I'll bring you right now to the, the statute itself. So uh, can everybody see the statute there? So this is the definition of crime victim in our current statute. Uh, and you'll notice everything here is in the past tense. So this is someone who has obtained a relief from abuse order under Title 15, a person who has obtained an order against stalking or sexual assault under 12 VSA Chapter 178, a person who has obtained an order against abuse of a vulnerable adult under Title 33, uh, and a victim as defined in 13 VSA 5301, provided that the victim is identified as a crime victim in an affidavit filed by a law enforcement officer with a prosecuting attorney, of competent state or federal jurisdiction and shall include the victim's child, foster child, parent, spouse, stepchild, or ward of the victim who lives with the victim, um, or a parent of the victim's spouse, provided that the individual is not identified in the affidavit as the defendant. So let me pull apart that last one here. So the, it includes a person who's identified as a victim under this section of Title 13, and then it includes their family member provided their family members, not the defendant in the action. Um, so that, that's important because if you have an issue of a domestic violence case here, uh, this is not protecting that individual against discrimination. Uh, so that, that is the, the part of it there. So let me just um, bring you now to the other section here. Um, whoop, wrong section, sorry about that. Uh, wait a second. Oh, it's under leave, I'm sorry. This is... So, now, if we look at the definition of employee here, it means a person who is a crime victim as defined in that definition we just read, and in consideration of direct or indirect gain or profit has been continuously employed by the same employer for a period of six months for at least 20 hours a week. So the second part of this is a standard employee definition. They're employed for some sort of gain or profit, money, benefits, et cetera. Um, by an employer, they've been employed for at least six months and they work an average of 20 hours a week. So they're a half time or better or more employee and they've been employed for six months. And that's, you know, sort of your, your base 
uh, employment to get protected status uh, for purposes of this leave. And then what we say is an employee shall be entitled to take unpaid leave from employment to attend a deposition or court proceeding related, related to uh, a criminal proceeding when the employee is a victim as defined in Title 13, a relief from abuse hearing. So very importantly here, the employee hasn't gotten this order yet, but they're seeking the order. But our definition of employee says they have to have gotten the order. So we have this internal inconsistency here where we're defining them as someone who's already gotten the order that they're seeking. And this is what Senator Benning caught and said, well, wait a second. If they're going to the hearing, there isn't a finding yet. You're prejudging. Mm. And that, that was his concern. And then when we started pulling it apart, we realized, well, hey, we use this definition from the anti-discrimination law, which says you can't discriminate against someone because they were a victim of domestic violence. Uh, but what we're saying here is you can get leave to attend your hearing to get your relief from abuse order. And then again, uh, the hearing in number three is concerning stalking or sexual assault, and four is the relief from abuse, neglect, or exploitation of an elder under Title 33. And so that, that's the internal inconsistency here and why this bill proposes to take out that reference to crime victims. You may also want to consider whether the calling it crime victims leave uh, is the appropriate title because these are, it's uh, in general, you're looking at people who are either uh, the identified as the victim of a crime pending a, a hearing on the crime or seeking a relief from abuse order of some sort. And that, that's the internal inconsistency here is that these are not adjudicated yet. These are instances where the individual is, is uh, seeking the adjudication or seeking the order. Um, yeah, Sorry. It's like trying to my head around. So it's basically, it's like, can you be a victim of before the accuser's convicted? Exactly. So under, under 13 VSA 5301, I'm going to stop the share just to, to get the other statute up here. But um, under 13 VSA 5301, the way that's drafted, and I'm, this isn't proposing to change that, um, but that is that is sort of drafted looking uh looking forward so it's um it defines let me just pull that definition here so this defines victim as a person who sustains physical emotional or financial injury or death as a direct result of the commission or attempted commission of a crime or active delinquency and shall also include the family members of a minor, a person who has found to be, uh, who has been found to be incompetent or a homicide victim. Um, and so this is, again, you're, you're looking here at, um, you know, the, uh, this is someone who's, who's been identified as sustaining physical, emotional, or financial in, injury. Um, what we're looking for uh, is um, in the actual statute itself, though, is that, uh, and again, I'm just going to reshare here, uh, is that the individual um, So again, the language here around victim may also be problematic. Um, and the, the question here is, is should be the, um, we should be saying when the employee is identified as a victim, um, you know, pending a proceeding and then they have an, a right or obligation to appear at the proceeding. Um, or should we be saying when the employee um, 
and th this is something where we may need more testimony here, but to address this internal inconsistency. Um, and th this is a, again, where, you know, uh, if your goal is to protect the people who are the alleged victims, you may want to say is an alleged victim. Um, and then victim has the same meaning as in 13 BSA 5301. Uh, and has the obligation or right to appear at a proceeding because what we're looking at here is is that in these cases here, none of these proceedings have actually been uh, gone to gone to the finish, but the we're seeking to give people the right to take time off from work to appear at the proceeding um, where the crime is being uh, or the alleged crime is being adjudicated or the relief from abuse order that they're seeking is being adjudicated. Uh, and so that, that's what this is. And so um, in some way- That adju adjudication could result in a negative- Right, it could result in a finding that a crime, the alleged crime didn't occur um, or a denial of the relief from abuse order. So this isn't a foregone conclusion, but what this statute is, is providing us the right to go to that hearing and take time off from work without losing your job. Um, so that, that's what the statute currently provides, but the way it's worded is it prejudges the victimhood here, and it also creates a catch-22 where you have to already be a victim in order to get leave to go to the hearing where they're going to determine if you are a victim or entitled to this relief from abuse order. Um, and so that, uh, unfortunately, is, is my drafting mistake um, from years ago. I totally would have caught that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's just even that. Yep. <clears throat> and that's why you guys are elected. Uh -huh. So, oh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, but yeah, so this is, this was a, a good catch elsewhere, but it, it also potentially presents problems for these individuals where they could be up against the, you know, they could argue, well, my job was protected. And then their employer could legitimately at this point say, well, actually, you, you weren't a victim yet. Um, so you weren't covered. Um, Representative Hagel, you had your hand up. Uh, I'm fine. Thank you. Whatever <laughs> I was going to ask has disappeared into the ether. Okay. Where is that a blue one? And so the solution lies in. So the, the main part of the solution is to strike the reference to the definition of crime victim, mm -hmm. but you may want to make some additional wording changes in there around where the individual is the alleged victim um, and then cross-reference the definition of victim and just say, uh, you know, in that way we're being clear. So we're, we're focusing the focusing of the employee definition would be on to just the employee's length of service and the number of hours they work, which was, it's in the existing law, take it off of this idea that they have to already be a victim. Right. <laughs> and then the, the next piece is to consider adding language around them being the alleged victim, because that hearing is, you know, the, the court hasn't made its determination yet. Um, and so if you say that they have to be the victim, um, then uh, they're, they're potentially caught in this catch-22 where they can't attend the trial related to the alleged crime that they suffered um, sure. in order to determine if they're a victim. Um, so that, that was the, the upshot of that. Um, so and would that be something like adding alleged victim or victim, like or you know? Yeah. So when the um, yeah, I would say when the employee is identified as the alleged victim um, in court filings or an affidavit filed by a law enforcement officer, um, so that. Uh, and then the employee has a right or obligation to appear at the proceeding is the, the next part of that. So uh, in some cases, uh, 
I, and I don't know enough about criminal law, but um, there may be instances when the employee does not have a right to appear at the proceeding, but I'm, I'm not sure what those would be. Okay. Um, but it's, but that, that was the qualification added there. And then we would pull the language saying, uh, as defined in 13 BSA 5301 from the actual right for the leave and put that into the definition section and just say, the term victim has the same meaning. There. Is that a trial and then, then, then Murphy? I would agree that, um, can everyone hear me? I would agree that um, uh, crime victim should be eliminated as a definition. It's, it's uh, um, in a situation in which um, a request for relief from abuse order or stalking or sexual assault uh, um, order uh, is brought to court um, that there is no um, crime that has been committed at that time at that point it's an allegation of uh, domestic violence but um, no crime is convicted if the individual um, uh, if the uh, defendant or perpetrator um, is convicted then it certainly is crime um, the definition that you showed I think it was under 5503 certainly um, defines victim in a way that would be accurate and particularly um, involving um, domestic assault because uh, it, the definition that talked about um, uh, uh, emotional stress and, uh, and such, uh, that would be um, uh, an adequate definition of victim in my opinion. Uh, and, but we should definitely eliminate crime. Uh, and I think the, um, uh, the, uh, addition of uh, alleged or purported victim would be um, a good uh, a, go a good uh, solution to this as well um, and, and of course if, if uh, the um, perpetrator is convicted then they would be a, a victim um, and uh, so I think that I think that we do need a little work on that but that's my experience would uh, suggest that uh, the person could be called a victim uh, or an alleged victim uh, but not a crime victim Representative Murphy. Yeah, my uh, sidetrack, because I realized this bill is about the victim, so I, I totally understand that, but it brought to my mind, I just wondered, what about leave for someone who's been accused so that, you know, there certainly are false accusations, I, and I, I just, is there anything similar in, in our laws that, that require an employer to allow someone time to defend themselves? There, there isn't. Uh, there is a proposal in the Senate that resulted from Senator Benning introduced as a result of our discussion um, when we were first parsing through this, um, which would provide leave for uh, anyone who has to attend a deposition or court proceeding, both uh, defendants and plaintiffs. Uh, but that, yeah, that's a separate proposal. It's, it's uh, S-157. Um, and so it would expand that. So the... the <laughs> um, Apparently, there's history. But uh, yeah, so the uh, that bill um, uh, is is out there as an alternative proposal if you want to look at it. Um, but that that would strike all of the specific qualifications here and replace it to with language saying leave for a court proceeding in, in an action to which the employee is a party or a deposition or court proceeding at which the employee is required to appear. So in other words, you've been, you're required to testify um, by way of subpoena or, or some other requirement like that. Um, and that would, you know, give, give employees sort of a general leave right related to court proceedings uh, ranging from divorce or custody proceedings in family court uh, to a civil trial or to a criminal trial in which you're the defendant, right. um, which was, uh, you know, his, his initial concern from his own work in his, uh, in his day job as a defense attorney. Um, so the, you know, the, the change that we're talking about here is much more limited in terms of just making the law consistent with its original intent instead of creating this catch-22 where people aren't allowed to take the leave in order to um, try to uh, achieve this result until they actually have the result, um, 
which is the, the circular nature of the current language. Um, and then his bill is, is definitely broader than that, but would yeah, get to the yeah. issue that you're thinking about there. Right, and I realize it's, it's as I said, this is a crime victim bill, so I, I get very different language, but it just did leave me curious because certainly um, whether you are the person who perpetrated whatever you're being accused of or not, um, before you even find out, potentially you lose your job because you got to either go to court and defend yourself or you got to go to work. So it just seems as if, again, that whole prejudge before you can get your moment ends up happening. So. Right. And that, I mean, even outside of the criminal context, there are, are any number of court proceedings exactly. where people have exactly. significant rights that are being adjudicated. Um, but that, you know, is, is a much bigger difference. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, at the time that this came forward, there wasn't, there were no protections whatsoever, especially for crime victims. That, um, okay. Yeah. So not a simple little bill. Uh, no, you got that uh, twenty-four minutes. So. Wow, really? It felt longer. Um, <laughs> no. Considering it's in your office, it's changed right now. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, all right. No, thank you. I, I, I think we'll, um, you know, I'll reach out to uh, Representative Grad Judiciary, who's a sponsor on this bill, because, you know, at, at this point, it may be better for them and, and see if, if S-157 is on their radar uh, at all. And I don't think it's even come off the wall in the Senate at this point. Yeah. I mean, if, we change, if we were to do this change, I mean, I would be perfectly happy with just make, you know, it seems like it's a corrective measure for what we had spent time on two years ago or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up. I just really wanted to, it, mm -hmm. the, the, the four the, the four the, the conversation of simple little bill is instructive to us in terms of you know just understanding the check of that I mean you, you say you didn't catch it you know three years ago or whatever it, it, I don't think it's a question of you catching it or not I think it's the awareness that comes out of I mean out of right field under a whole different context that and somebody who paid attention to it late you know just brought in a different point of view. And all of a sudden the word smithing comes up and you're just like, oh, but wait, right. I see it. Yeah. But my, yeah, I mean, I do remember at the time we were just thinking of, you know, was being done with the discrimination protections. And I remember the conversation was, oh yeah, we'll just copy that definition and, and cross-reference it and it'll be easy. And um, and, it, <laughs> and it'll be easy. <laughs> it occurred very quickly um as these things tend to do um and yeah you know when the things get going quickly here uh it's those little details that escape and hopefully they don't happen too often but um yeah yeah so um we'll discuss that we'll discuss this okay another time great anything else that uh if you want to pull up off off the calendar and tackle this morning <laughs> while I'm here. Uh, well, sure, <laughs> no. Um, we got 32 yeah, minutes left on the clock. <laughs> no, we're gonna we're gonna take yeah, we're gonna take extra time. Um, I do. Uh, Representative Kalaki has his hand up. Yeah, I, Chair, I think this question's for you because you and Maxine Grad were the ones who put this forward. Um, I understand the clarification about the the crime victim. Um, or alleged, I think that's really important. Um, but when uh, Barbara mentioned the other thing and we have in the Senate that language, would that language be inappropriate to integrate into this one? Would it still serve the, in the intent that you had in, in this bill or is it really a different intention? Well, I think it broadens the intent, of course, if it's including everyone and I think it opens us up for for you know the need to hear from, I would say probably copious witnesses that would that would testify on um, victims' rights and criminals' rights and human rights, uh, you know whatever 
whatever this the broad language and i think that's better served for the judiciary committee if it's going up into that larger scale we were dealing with it from from a, a you know a incredibly narrow perspective of of you know crime victims work related issues that um and i think that it, you know, for us to undertake the change that might be proposed in S-157 would lead us to have to be educated on the larger, the larger range of what rights people have once they're charged in our just in our judicial system. And um, I think that's a much larger, I think that's a much larger bill if you don't have the context for it in your portfolio, which we don't. I mean, it's much more of a judicial situation when you enlarge it that far, then I think the, the narrow approach that we took, which was work related um, when we originally took it up. Okay, thank you. And, and I think what you're saying makes sense. I would agree with you. But when I looked it up, it actually in the Senate got referred to the Committee on Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs. So the Senate didn't send it to their judiciary, which is interesting. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that may be a function of um, Senator Benning sitting on, I believe he sits on judiciary. Yeah, that morning. So they may have, yeah, he sits on judiciary. So they may have wanted to send it to the employment committee first. Um, but that, uh, you know, bill referral is a, a chamber thing. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's stop on this bill now. Um, and before I let y'all go for an early lunch, I did receive an email. I just asked Ron to send it to everybody from the clerk's office on the question that we posed yesterday about whether or not Representative Higley's amendment was out of order. And they, their opinion is that it's not out of order because the substantial change comes from uh, the larger amendment, okay. not okay. necessarily with the amendment that Representative Higley is proposing. So we'll hear that. And um, if anybody challenges it on the floor, then it'll be ruled in order. Okay. Um, so the larger amendment, the substantive nature of the larger amendment validated the attempt at a repetitive amendment? Yes. Okay. Because it alters the bill, not be the original bill anymore. Yep, we're not dealing with the original bill. If this right. were, if if well, obviously, if they had concurred the with this bill, bill. Yeah. if the Senate had concurred with this bill, this wouldn't be an issue, right? And so the fact that we have received it back is more than technical changes. Yep. And so, um, so his request to uh, his re request to request to amend that is um, again, the, the, the substantive changes or the substantial difference appears in the, the bill that's attempting right. to be amended, not the amendment itself, even though it's a word for word. That's a good procedural hack to know. Yeah, no, I'm glad we asked. Yeah. It's, uh, I, think, it's I think it's really based too on the fact that the Senate proposal of amendment was a strike call. <clears throat> ah. So no matter how little they changed it, they did a strike off. So it's a new bill. Which I wouldn't have even noticed in you know, no. the discussion. No, was. we weren't discussing that. So I think that's the technicality that it relies on. Mm -hmm. Details, details, details. And you were making fun of me for being focused on details. <laughs> or being no. irritated. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm entertained and irritated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I know. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, on the committee now for a year and a half, it's just, you know, when somebody sent me a text at some point about what's she doing, I'll just be like, who knows? It's probably, you know, catching stuff. She read the film, did you? Just a reminder, we're still alive. Yes, we're going off. We're going off now.